Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a good morning so far. It's raining outside, which is very good for the Torah that we're learning. That the rain of Hashem represents Hashkacha Partit. And it's reflected in the tears that we cry to Hashem when we're struggling, when we need help. And Rabbi Nachman says that those tears draw Hashkacha Partit. They draw providence from the future. Because the essence of this world is it's like a body without a soul. It's a tsura, it's a form, but it doesn't have ruach. And the interesting thing that Rabbi Nachman is alluding to is that we know that there is ruach in this world. We know that there is souls in this world. We know that there is a spirit in this world and it's what's driving everything. But the Chiddush of Rabbi Nachman is it's not from here, it's coming from the future. And we're also not from here. We're also coming from the future. And therefore, back to the future has a whole different meaning now, <laughs> considering the, uh, the implications of such a statement. This is the reason why we feel like strangers. This is the reason why we feel isolated. This is the reason why we feel lonely, because we're not from here. We're from the future. And um, and this is what we're yearning to get back to. We're yearning to go back home. We're yearning to go to the land of Israel. We're yearning to go to Olam Haba. We're yearning to go to the place where our souls were created. We're yearning to go back home. And while we're here, we're learning that the cause of our pain, the cause of our suffering, Rabbi Nachman says, is simply from not knowing what's going on. It's not from the events themselves. It's not from the circumstances. It's not from the challenges, even though those are all real. And we feel them every day. But the Kiddush is, the novelty is, that it's not coming from those events themselves. It's actually coming from a lack of knowledge. Just as an example, today I just spoke to somebody when I was in the mikvah before, and um, he was dating a girl, and I guess she broke it off, or the family broke it off, and this is not the first time he's had such a situation. He's been trying many years now to get married, and obviously it's a very painful situation when you invest yourself emotionally in somebody and something, it doesn't work out especially when you feel that your whole kind of life is, is dependent on getting that thing started. And when that gets started, then I can move into all these other things. So there's a lot, uh, a lot, of, a lot going on there. And I saw he was in a lot of pain. And I, I asked him, I said, if in two years from now, you knew for a fact you're going to be married and you're also going to have a stable job and you're going to be settled down, for sure, 100%. Two years from now, though. Until then, you have no parnasa. Nothing is, you're going to do is going to work. And every girl that you go out with is going to end it. But you know for a fact that two years from now, the situation is going to be completely different. You will find the one that you're looking for. You will have a stable income. But that's only two years from now. I said, would you be upset any day for the next two years until you get there? He said, I don't understand the question. I said, just think about what I said. Say, I told him again. I said it over again. But obviously, he's in a lot of pain. And when a person's in pain, they kind of want to sink into the pain. They don't want to uh, move out of the pain. There's a taiva almost a desire to, to move uh, more intensely into it instead of moving away, which Rabbi Nachman says comes from our Yetzirah, the side of us which is trying to draw us to negativity. I told him again. And he said, no, obviously, I wouldn't be in any pain. So I said, what does that teach you? He said, I don't know. I said, the reason why you're in pain is not because the girl broke it off and it's not because you're struggling financially. It's because you don't think it's good for you. Because you don't think it's good for you, you're in pain. Because you don't know that ultimately things are gonna work out, you're in pain. Because you think that things will always be a time of struggle, that things will always be uh, a time of difficulty and challenge, for that reason, you're in pain. And he said, you're right. 
And this is the proof of what Rabbi Nachman's teaching. It's not the events in our life that are causing us pain. It's the fact that we don't know that in the end, it's going to work out. And the whole entire thing which Rabbi Nachman is trying to mamish push into our hearts, to force into our hearts, is to believe with simple faith that everything is for the good. And that ultimately when the story of a person plays out and the Megillah is completely read all the way through, that you will see that not only did everything turn out well, but that all along the way, all the things that happened to you that seemed to be pulling you away from happiness, those were all the cause of what ultimately took place. That was the good you were looking for. And even though this might seem simple, or even though this might seem uh, too innocent or too naive, this is the Ikar Rabbi Nachman says of life, to come to this realization to come to this internalization that all of the other things, whether it's the learning of Torah or it's the getting married, even those things are subsidiary. They are secondary to this simple faith that Rabbi Nachman says that while people hold a Muna to not be that important, they hold a Muna faith to be something very little. I say that it's very great. I say that it's very important. In fact, I say it's the most important thing that there is. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, um, possibly the greatest spiritual master that ever lived in some respects, and for sure the most revolutionary. And the great-grandfather, Rabbi Nachman, when he was about to pass away, he said out loud, I give up everything that I know, and I take upon myself complete emuna Pashuta, simple faith. What was he trying to say with that? Why would he do that? He spent his whole life toiling to be able to draw down higher and higher levels of revelation of godliness. And the levels which he had had never been experienced by anybody in history. <laughs> and when he went to go pass away, he said, I'm giving them all up. And instead, I'm taking on myself the faith that a little Jewish child has before the world uh, destroyed his faith. Because the essence and the ichor is that in the end, faith is actually higher than all knowledge. Because faith begins where knowledge ends. And no matter how much knowledge a person has, it's always limited. Even if he knows everything, that's still limited. Because knowing everything is everything. A thing is limited. When you know everything, you know to the extent of limitation. Faith, emuna, begins where knowledge ends. And for this reason, the Baal Shem Tov says, I rather have simple faith of a child than every single thing that I know, which is more than anybody's known probably since Adam Rishon, since the first man. So with that being said, all the more so us, that this is what we're working towards achieving in our life. That simple faith to believe that everything that's happening to us is for the best. It's because Hashem loves us. It's to bring us closer to him. This is the goal of our lives. This is the goal of our days. And with this, you have everything. And without it, you have nothing. The Rav Shalom Aru says that the Gan Eden, paradise, ecstasy, peace of mind, and Gehenna, sadness, depression, hell, they're right next to each other. They don't exist in two opposite worlds, in two opposite universes. They are actually literally right next to each other. Like, Queens and Brooklyn. What's standing in between these two places? Rav Arush says, Emuna. That the only thing that's standing in between Gan Eden and Gehenna, two completely different, opposite, paradoxical states of existence, one in which we strive for, we yearn for, we cry for, the other in which we yearn and we strive and we cry to leave. The only thing that's standing in between them is simple faith of that of a Jewish woman or child. If I had a mic, I would just drop it and leave. You know, I heard that people do stuff like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It wasn't that great what I just said. Okay. And when you want to move away from Dad, or when Dad leaves you, meaning she meaning he doesn't know. This person, this Jew, 
does not realize yet that everything that's ever taken place in his life, including right now at this very moment, even the smoke that's coming out of this guy's nose is from Hashem's hashkacha. That Hashem wants that to be taking place right now. He's causing that the smoke should come out. That if the smoke wasn't coming out, it's because Hashem wants it to. And if it's coming out, it's because Hashem has decided this very moment, He wants that that should take place. Otherwise, it couldn't. It's not only simply because this person chose. But the higher consciousness is to understand that while it's true that that person is choosing, it does not negate the fact that Hashem is causing it to happen. This is something that we can't understand. How could it be both? Rabbi Nachman says it is, and you can't understand. And don't try to investigate any further. This is the entire Raza Dehemnuta, like the Zohar says. This is the secret of Amuna. To believe that without understanding it, that they both coexist. And Rav Natan is saying that when a person loses consciousness of this, he falls asleep, he doesn't realize that everything that's taking place in his life is truly the supervision, the orchestration, of Hashem Yibarach, the sovereign Shiyesh Teva, and he holds to himself. He has a Shita in life. He has a perspective in life which he holds by. That is called Teva, nature, cause and effect, consequence. Ani Maloch, I run my life. I cause what happens that's good. I cause that what's happened that's bad. That the reason why um, I suffer from whatever I suffer from is for physical, historical, social, psychological consequences. It's not because Hashem wants it to be taking place. That is crazy to think that the reason why I struggle financially is not because I'm in a downtime in the economy after the COVID uh, virus. And it's not because Hashem simply does not want me to be making money right now because it's the best thing that could be happening to me. So for that person that he holds by Teva Chas Shalom, Rav Natan says, and this is a very interesting, his language. It's not just, um, you know, he holds by nature. This is a lower level, level of understanding. Usually the way that the sages, they use Chas Shalom, that lower language shouldn't be on us. We should never experience such a thing. Is when we speak about the Holocaust, is when we speak about the Shoah, is when we speak about the Inquisition, it's when we speak about the um, genocide that the Jewish people have experienced without me, we say, we shouldn't experience such a thing in our lives, illness. And he's using the same thing, that when a Jew holds by nature, instead of holding by a muna, chas v'shalom, Rav Natan says, that that person should experience such a thing. This is the concept that a Jew is sleeping. That his da'at, his knowledge, his connection, his consciousness is a, in exile. It's lagarish, it's expelled from his mind. It's the concept of even if it's daytime and it's beautiful where he is, he's really in nighttime and he's sleeping. Because the essence of light, the essence of the light of day, it's the concept of knowing. When a person knows, it's the concept of the light of day. Rabbi Nachman explains in the first tour of Mukut Maran that the whole essence of the sun is it provides clarity. Why do we like when the sun is out? Because we're able to see. What are we able to see? Where we're going. What causes a person so much pain? He doesn't know where he's going. The greatest pain that a person has is when he doesn't have clarity in his life. One person who has a very great Rebbe, who has a very great Sadiq, he could be going through a million difficult things. But if he speaks to his Rebbe and he gives him direction and clarity about what to do and where to go, even though maybe his circumstances have not changed, he can go through those same exact things with simcha, with joy, because he has clarity in his life. Another person could have everything. He could have all the money. He could have all of the fame. He could have all of the honor. He could have all of the accolades, all of the homes, all of the cars. He could have the perfect trophy wife. And if that person does not have clarity, he could be miserable from the time he wakes up till he goes to sleep. Because the whole entire essence of joy comes from clarity. Clarity comes from knowing that everything is from Hashem. That's Da'at. This is the light of the day. When a person has that, then even at nighttime, he's happy. Because for him, it's still like daytime. Like we say about Hashem, that for him, there is no day or nighttime. Because by him, it's perfect clarity. And the clarity itself, and this is the whole entire paradox, the knowledge that we're talking about is a knowledge of faith. We're knowing, but the knowing is rooted in Amuna. 
Kemuva, like it's brought. Hainu meaning kia or because the light who rock Hashem iparach because there is no light beside Hashem, meaning this light of da, this light of clarity that we're talking about, that we yearn for, that we move to different places in the world simply so that we can have good weather, so we can feel the light on our faces, that they actually have a, a disorder that they have diagnosed people with, that is seasonal affective disorder. That they say that when a person doesn't have sunlight, he moves into depression. But when he has sun, he feels good about himself. That this person literally puts on himself a light which reflects. And it is a parallel to actual sunlight. And he holds the light to his face for an hour every morning. Even while he's at work, so he feels better. This is the power of the sun. That in those places that it's darker... In Alaska, where you barely see the sun, you have very high rates of mental health disorders there. Why? Because we need the sun. We need the light. Comes Rabbi Nachman to say, do you know why we need the light? Do you know why it makes us feel good? Because the light is Hashem himself. That's why we love to lay in it. Because we're laying in the experience. We're being encompassed. We're, become, we are, we're becoming absolved. We're becoming... Um, absorbed or becoming enmeshed within the light of Hashem. Kibichol, so to speak. Where do we learn this from? Bechina, because it's from the Pasuk, it says, Hashem orivi ishi. The David HaMelech says in Tehillim, this is Parak 27, Hashem is my light, He is my Redeemer. So when David is saying, Hashem is my light, he's not speaking poetically, Rabbi Nachman saying. He's trying to clue us into a very deep paradigm, a very deep reality that Hashem is light. The concept of light, the concept of clarity, the concept of joy. This is Hashem himself. That when a person is smiling to you, what you see is not that person. You're seeing Hashem. That's the reason why you'd be going through something very deep and very troubling and trialing. All of a sudden, a guy comes to you with a huge smile on his face, says, how's it going? And all of a sudden, you feel better. Rabbi Nachman says in Sikhot Taran, how is that possible? Because what you're giving to him is God itself. The reason why he's feeling better when he sees you smile is because he just saw Hashem. Bechina, like it says, Kel Hashem Be'er Lanu. That Hashem, He illuminates to us light. Ze'ikar or Hashemesh. This is the essence of the light of the sun. Bechina, ki Hashemesh, umagen Hashem tzivaot. Because the Pasuk says, because it, the sun and the shield Hashem is. Meaning to say that the reason why Hashem created the sun and He created a moon is to give us a parallel to our relationship with Hashem. What is Hashem to us? Kiv yechol, so to speak. And this is not to make Hashem physical. This is not to say that Hashem is the Son, Chas Shalom. He's not. But the reason why Hashem created the sun and the moon, why He created light and darkness, is to show the parallel of the relationship between us and Him in this world. That is of Mashpia and Makabel. That is between light and vessel. That the degree to which we make ourselves a vessel, that we make ourselves like the moon, to that degree we can receive the light of the sun. Because like the Zohar says, and like Rabbi Nachman brings in the first tour of the Kutumaran, how is the moon able to receive the light of the sun? How is it able to shine out so bright at, at nighttime when things are dark, when things are unclear, when we're struggling? Why is the moon shining so bright? Because the Zohar says that the moon has no light of its own. Because the moon has no light of its own, it's able to makabal, it's able to receive the light of the sun, even when you don't see it. Meaning to say that we are like the moon. And in this world where we don't see the sun, where Hashem is hidden from us, we need to make ourselves like the moon and to stop avoiding that, to stop running from that, to stop trying to make ourselves like our own light, stop trying to make ourselves like the sun, that I control my life but instead to move into an opposite mode of existence. I'm going to stop trying to be a light of my own, and I'm going to start to become a vessel to receive a light which is greater than me. And this is the whole entire ikra of being attached to a tzaddik, because by having hikashu with a tzaddik, I'm automatically becoming a greater vessel for the light of Hashem. 
Because as soon as I attach myself to a spiritual master and I follow his advice and I learn his wisdom, I, it's mashma, it's implied, the implication is that he knows more than me. Automatically, I have assumed myself into the realm of a, a vessel. Whereas prior to that, that I'm making my own decisions, I'm going according to my own intellect, according to my own emotional intelligence, according to my own uh, intuition. So as a result of that, even if I'm the smartest person in the world, even if I'm the most emotionally capable person in the world, even if I myself am very intuitive and wise, but because I'm going according to my own, I have made myself like the sun. And when a person has made themselves like the sun, they can't receive a light that's greater than them. Automatically, they're limiting themselves. And this is the cause of their struggles. But the ability to be able to achieve receiving the light of the Ein Sof, the light of the infinite one, a person needs to make themselves, Rabbi Nachman says, like the moon. Like Rabbi Nachman brings in the Kutamaran that it says in Tilim, Lifnei Shemesh, before the sun, Yinon Shemo. His name is Yinon. Now Rabbi Nachman explains there and it's taught by Chazal that one of the names of Mashiach is Jinun. There's different names of Mashiach, four names that they bring down in the Gemara, in the Midrash. The first one is Menachem, which is one of the reasons why the students of Chabad believe very much that Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch was the Mashiach. The next one is Shin, which is Shiloh which means a gift to him. Because we know that when the Mashiach comes, all the world is going to come around him and, so to speak, give them their tribute, give them their gift. Then we have the Yud in Mashiach. That is Jinon. And then finally, there is the Chet, which is Hananya. These four names are an acronym for Mashiach itself. They actually all represent different aspects of this one Mashiach. One of them is Yinon, which means what? So Rabbi Nachman explains that Yinon means he will make himself, which is the concept of the Yud. The Yud is the future tense, that he will become the Nun, Yinun, that he will make himself like a Nun. The Nun in the Hebrew alphabet is corresponding to the moon, is corresponding to the Malchut, it's corresponding to the humble empty vessel, meaning to say that the reason why the Mashiach is able to bring the Geula, is able to bring the redemption, and that we ourselves are able to tap into our own personal Mashiach, our own redemption, our own um, salvation from our difficulties and challenges and circumstances in our life, is when we make ourselves like the moon, that we stop trying to uh, put out an external light of our own, but instead we make ourselves like a vessel in which we can receive a light which is infinite by making ourselves like the nun. And then we can receive the light of the sun. We can receive the light of Hashem. Hainu meaning, that when a person knows that Hashem is the orchestrator of the world, that He's the leader of the world, that he is the conductor of the world, and he does it not through Teva, but he does it through his own decisions, his own personal stamp, his own acute perception and decisions at every given moment. That's what's causing reality to take place, not the laws of nature. The Ikar or this is the this is the essence of a Jew having light in his life. Because the essence of the light in every place that's found light, it's the light of the sun. That's what's bringing light to that place. Even we see in homes now that they're trying to bring natural light. Where's the natural light coming from? It's a reflection of the light of the sun. And it goes out from there. And that light that goes out from the light is merely a reflection and a parallel a microcosm of the light of Hashem Yiparach, keep your whole, so to speak, Shema'ir, that he is the only luminary in existence, that he is the one who illuminates in the world. 
And when we fall, chas v'shalom, that when we fall, mizerdat, when we fall from this knowing, this inner knowing that Hashem is the manhig of the world, that He's the leader of every collective experience, that He is the orchestrator of every particular individual experience that I have throughout my day, He's the cause of it, not just that He's a passive watcher, but that He is the active creator creator at every moment and he now is invested in he's dependent on he's hanging on teva he's hanging on nature this is the essence of the removal of the light he is effectively cutting himself off from this ultimate light in the world and then he is in the concept of nighttime and darkness, chas v'shalom, that he has placed himself in darkness, all because he is removed from the knowledge that Hashem is the cause of what's taking place, and he has invested himself even for one moment in that nature is the cause of whatever is going on, and that circumstance and happenstance is the cause of what's taking place in his life. Like it says in Yeshaya, that the darkening of the sun with its going out, that the sun and the moon are blackened, and many other pasukim like this, they're all referring to the time of the exile. They're all referring to our current time of existence of suffering. That every single pasuk is using the same in imagery. It's using the same lashon, the same language. To speak about the fact that the darkening of the sun or the removal of the sun from its sheath. These are all referring to our exile, our suffering. It's coming only because the sun is hidden from us. The light is hidden from us. The fact that Hashem is the manhig is hidden from us. Hainu meaning ki begalut nechshav ki ilu nechashach or Hashemech. Because in the exile it's considered as if that the light of the sun is darkened. Ki galut nimshal laila. Because the exile, it is the parallel to nighttime. Kemuva beferush rashi. Like Rashi, the most famous commentator, who is not coming to explain deep Kabbalistic secrets. Rashi is coming only to explain the simple, um, the simple understanding of every single aspect of the Torah, which is true. It's just as true as the Kabbalah. It's just not mystical. It's the simple understanding. Like I say to you, what are you eating right now? I'm eating food. That's the simple example. Now, on a deeper level, why are you eating that food? There's many reasons for that. Rashi is coming to explain the very simple explanation. And Rashi himself is saying that Lila, nighttime, is the concept of exile. Like it says, ki galut, meaning that the time of the Galut, that it's drawn only from our investment in nature. And then the darkening of the light from its going out. He take care because the strength because immediately when a person invests himself that nature is the cause that circumstances are the cause that happenstance is the cause then he departs from the light of the sun and then for him it's like the sun is darkened mamash literally because in truth, because in truth, there is not to the sun light at all. It's only the light of Hashem. And it just looks like it's coming from the sun. But in truth, the light that's emanating from the sun is only Hashem's light. And it's reflecting itself from this vessel that's called the sun. And therefore, the exile, and therefore, Nighttime is always compared to exile from our sages. Ki ikar galut, because the essence of the exile collectively of humanity, collectively of the Jewish people, personally of the Jewish soul, 
the essence of that exile rock, it's only, only, only mechamat because shetolin b'teva, because a Jew at some given point in his life, in his year, in his month, in his week, in his day, he believes that nature is the cause of what's happening to him. He believes that circumstance is the cause of what's happening to him. He believes that happenstance is what's happening to him. Chas v'shalom. V'zai hu b'chinat layla v'choshech. And then he has placed himself within the concept of darkness and nighttime. He's talk with the or, and the light immediately departs from him. This is all the concept of sleep. Because the departure of knowledge, meaning the, the knowledge of knowing that everything is whatever Hashem wants it to be. Shazet ikar or that this is the essence of the light. Alken bishaat shena. Therefore, at the time of sleep, sitra dim sava sharia al barnash. That the Zohar says that the side of impurity it now dwells. It's now resting on a person. Why is the forces of impurity, the force of negativity? Resting on a person, Badafka at the time that he sleeps, the Zohar Akadosh says, the Iker al and specifically on the hands, Kamoshika to Bazar Akadosh, like it says in Zohar Akadosh, Ikar Sitra Akra, because the essence of the Sitra Akra, the essence of the forces of impurity, of negativity, of sadness, of depression, of confusion, Hembechinata Ovde Kochavim, they are all from the concept of. Those who are invested in, believe in science alone. Those who believe in nature alone. Kiyadua, like it's known. Because Rabbi Nachman explains that where does nature come from? Where do the concept of science draw itself from? It's actually drawing itself from Kafir with atheism. That even though to some extent it's true, that every single wisdom actually draws itself from a belief. This is a very deep thing. Where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from belief. What you believe in causes the wisdom that takes place within you. When you have a Muna in Hashem, you're going to find truth which corroborates your belief. But when you don't believe in Hashem, specifically that you don't believe that Hashem is the cause of the thing that takes place in your life, then you draw the knowledge of Teva, of nature, and it becomes a vicious reciprocal cycle. Just for a personal example, let's say, for instance, all of a sudden I'm bullied by kids at school. And I don't believe it's from Hashem because I didn't grow up in a family that believes in a Shabbat, that believes in the Torah. They didn't know anything about it. They came from a family that came from the Holocaust. They came from the camps. They don't have any type of Jewish education. Now, all of a sudden, I'm bullied by those around me. And I come to my parents and I tell them what happened to me. And they tell me, don't worry. They're just kids. They don't know anything. You're really good. But what happens to me? I feel that I'm bad. I feel that there's something wrong with me. Why? Because the sun has departed from me. Because I don't understand that the only reason I was bullied is because for whatever reason, Hashem wanted that to happen to me. Because that's the best thing that could take place for me. Because that's going to make me a greater, greater vessel for light so I can get closer to him. But I didn't know any of that then. So I broke, I shattered. What does that kid do now? He then clings to atheism. He clings to science. Why? Because evolution is going to explain that, what, that, that example, that, that situation. Why? Because evolution is going to show that the reason why he was bullied is because those kids are trying to assert their own dominance so that they can then find women who they can mate with. And it's not on purpose. It's not conscious. They're not doing it because they're trying to. This is reality. The reality is we're just monkeys. And because we're all monkeys, we're all trying to assert our own dominance. You happen to come into the pathway, unfortunately, of that assertion of dominance so that they can mate with their other monkey friends. And now as a result of that, you became the funky monkey and you're on the outside looking in. 
all of a sudden, now you're the funky chunky monkey. And now you feel horrible about yourself. But now at least it makes sense to me. Why have I become the funky monkey? It's all because I'm just a monkey. And now what ends up happening is I go deeper into depression. I go deeper into atsu. I go deeper into meaninglessness. I go deeper into the abyss of atheism. And I start to invest myself even more and more and more in science and nature because that's all that there is according to me. So we see here that the whole entire root of nature for me is first my kafir, not believing in Hashem, that the cause of what's taking place is from Him. And this is the essence of the root of the Yetzirah, of the force of negativity in our life. Shenikra el Acher, that it's called another God, a foreign God, a foreign power. Acher. Meaning what? Kafirut, atheism. Kamuva, like it's brought. Hainu kishatolim bateva. And this is all the root of Teva, of nature, chas v'shalom. Shemisham ikar yenikat hakum. That this is where draws the non-Jewish world their sustenance from. That they draw it from Teva. That the Jewish people, where are they getting their inner sustenance from? Where do they get their life force from? Why is it that when a Jewish person learns science, he doesn't all of a sudden become infused with energy and life force? He wants to go conquer the world now when he hears about the laws of nature. Why is that not happening for him? But why is it that when he learns the Torah of Rabbi Nachman ben Fego, when he learns the Torah of Tzadikim, all of a sudden, a light starts to come inside of him. He starts to feel lighter. He starts to feel happier. He starts to feel more excited. Why? We see that the non-Jewish world, when they learn science, they get amped up. How come when we learn science, maybe it's uh, intellectual curiosity and it gives us um, some type of nachat, but it doesn't give us a life force. It doesn't give us energy. Why? The answer is because that's not our spiritual food. The food of a Jew is a muna. The food of a non-Jew is science. The reason why we suffer and we struggle when we believe only in science and only in nature is because it's not the root of our souls. But the non-Jewish world, where does it get its chiyot, its life force from? It gets it from Teva, it gets it from nature. And that's why it's good, it's okay for them to believe in it. Because when they believe in it, that's the root of their souls. But when you try and believe only in that, you suffer. You go into depression, you go into anxiety, you go into sadness, you go into drug abuse, you go into substance abuse, you go into mental health disorder. Why? Because that's not the root of your soul. And whenever a soul is disconnected from its root, just like a plant is disconnected from the ground, it starts to wither, it starts to die, it starts to fade away. But as soon as it's planted in the ground, as soon as it's planted in a muna, it starts to blossom. It starts to become beautiful. It starts to grow fruit. It starts to uh, um, branch out and even give birth to other fruit as well. And therefore, the time of sleep, what's taking place? You move into a state of unconsciousness, meaning your belief that Hashem is causing everything that's going on in your life that's removed from you because you're going into sleep. Your mind is going into exile. And then it strengthens the concept of nature on you. The concept of the strength of the exile that's drawn from the nighttime and the sleep. And you're drawing now instead from the strength of nature. It's weighing on you. That's why you're heavy when you're sleeping. That's why your pulse slows down when you're sleeping. Because you're no longer drawing from a moon, so to speak. You're drawing from nature only. And when a Jew draws from nature only, everything slows down. His mind slows down. His heart slows down. His body slows down. Everything in him slows down. And this is the, what the Zohar is speaking about, that it says when a Jew goes to sleep, meaning not just physically, but spiritually, when he loses sight and track of the fact that Hashem is the cause of whatever is taking place in his life, that when he fell off his chair and broke his hand, he didn't do it because he's an incompetent dimwit. He did it because Hashem wanted him to fall off the chair and sprain his, uh, uh, his hand. That's why when a person believes that it's because he's incompetent and because he wasn't careful enough, 
automatically that Jew is going to go into depression. He's going to go into sadness. He's going to go into anxiety because the spirit of impurity is now resting on him because he has disconnected himself from the root of his own soul. But if he realizes the reason he fell from the chair and sprained his ankle or he sprained his uh, wrist is simply because Hashem wanted him to, automatically he draws life force in that place. Automatically he draws down joy automatically he draws down faith automatically he draws down connection and 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 and, and um purpose in his life and this is where we're moving towards this is what we're trying to achieve in our life anybody have any questions for what we're saying so far You can either say them out loud, you can write them below. It's very good to ask questions. Don't be shy. Rabbi. Go ahead. Um, so how do you how do you how do you do to explain a uh, a person that you know they don't have they haven't reached the, the level of a Munah, they don't have the they haven't reached the level of uh, you know what we're learning. The moon is flame. Tell- complete the moon. Everything comes from Hashem. And then Hazrat Shalom, uh, this message that you're giving today that everything comes from Hashem. I'm not giving it, by the way. I'm just giving over Rabbi Nachman Rav Natan says. Right, that. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, let's say the person loses a father or mother or or any close relative that they very close to, okay. and uh, that way or a certain way or or the, something very bad happened to the person and. What do you think the person is gonna is gonna say? They, they're gonna have shalom, have uh, resentment, and 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 something with Hashem. That's why some people, uh, if you see people that went to the Holocaust, a lot of people don't believe in Hashem. They went uh, atheists. They went uh, another way because. Oh, they- Daniel, 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 Daniel! I know where you're going with this. You're making a mistake. Listen, the reason why they came out of there being upset with Hashem. Is because they think that Hashem let something bad happen. When a person thinks that Hashem is letting something bad happen to them, automatically we become very resentful. If, for instance, when I was going into my depressive episodes, like I had so many of, that all the time that I thought Hashem was allowing me to suffer, that for sure is the cause that he moves away from Hashem. What Rav Natan is saying and what Rabbi Nachman is saying is not that. Hashem is not allowing a person to suffer. He is causing it. Now, even though on paper, that would appear to be worse. (laughs) That would appear to be uh, an even greater reason for me to move away. But part of the amuna in Hashem that Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan are giving us is not just that Hashem is the active cause of whatever is taking place. And not just that he's allowing things to happen. But that the very reason that Hashem is doing whatever he's doing is only for one reason alone, Rabbi Nachman says. Because he loves you, because he wants the best for you, and because he wants you to draw closer to him through whatever is taking place. Meaning to say that what's the reason, at least on some basic level, that Hashem allowed me to experience such horrifying bouts of depression? Because up until that point, I thought that I controlled my own life. I was trying to be my own son instead of being a vessel for a light which was greater than me. I believed only in nature and in circumstance and in genetics and in science. And as a result of that, I thought I had a genetic disorder which I can never get over. And therefore, I am constantly going to have to be battling with this. But if I know that Hashem is the cause of my depression, and it's not because I inherited it, then all of a sudden, I have a lot to talk to Hashem about. Whereas before, I had nothing to speak to Hashem about because he's just a sideline. He's just a passenger. He's waiting on the side, just watching me suffer. So now I'm very angry with him. Why are you doing, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But if I know what Rabbi Nachman is saying, and I internalize this in my heart, that I'm depressed because Hashem wants me to be. And the reason he wants me to be is because he loves me with an infinite love. And the reason why it's expressing itself in this way for me is because this is going to cause me to come closer to Hashem than any possible other event that would take place in my life. 
then all of a sudden, I now have the grounds for taking a huge step forward closer to Hashem. Because now what am I going to start doing? I'm going to start doing something called Hibodadut. I'm going to spend less time going to see doctors, and I'm going to spend more time talking to Hashem and asking Him, what do you want from me? Why are you doing this to me? You want me to be closer to you? Great. How can I do that? And all of a sudden, ideas start popping into my head. Maybe I need to learn more about who you are. Maybe I need to learn more about how spirituality works. Maybe I need to uh, um, humble myself more to what you want to be happening as opposed to what I want to be happening. So it's, it's even though on paper, it might look like a person might move away from Hashem when he realizes that everything is from Hashem. But what you see, and it's Badafka, only a Jew who can hop this in this world. And if a Jew can't, if a, can't hop this in this world, Rabbi Nachman say he wasn't at Har Sinai. He might not be Jewish. Because what happens, you see that when a Jewish person realizes that everything is from Hashem, he automatically feels relief. Now on paper, it might not make sense why that is. But the real reason is, is because he's reconnected to reality. That Rabbi Nachman says that when a Jew has invested in lies, that's what's causing his sadness. It's not the events that's taking place. But as soon as a Jew knows that everything is from Hashem, he automatically feels better. He doesn't resent Hashem. He feels better. There's no way to explain this. This is not a logical process. But you see, Lamaisa, it's a fact that when a person goes, he's going through divorce, he's going through depression, he's going through this, he's going through mental health, physical health. All of a sudden, he puts on a Gedalia fence to sure. He goes to a Rav Shalom lesson. And he just hears from, uh, from Rav Shalom, everything's from Hashem. Everything's from Hashem. You were abused. It's from Hashem. You went through trauma. It's from Hashem. And all of a sudden, that person has a huge weight just melt off of them. Because the real, they, re, they realize that the reason why my parents did this to me is not because I have, unfortunately, and by chance, incompetent, horrifying, abusive parents. But because for whatever reason that I don't understand, Hashem believes that the best thing for me is to break as a result of having parents like this and now to have to fill up with my only real parent that I have that is Hashem Yipra. That we saw that with Esther and Malka in the time of Purim. Why was she the redeemer of the Jewish people? It's Badiuk specifically. Daika. Because she didn't have parents. Because she was an orphan. And as a result of that, she knew who her dad was. But we, that we have parents, we don't know who our dad is. So we end up attributing everything else to our physical parents. When in reality, you have one real father, you have one real mother, and your physical parents are the manifestation of that and everything else in your life as well. This is the whole entire difference between living a life of joy, of happiness, of peace, or living a life of despair, of yeush of anger, of resentment, is one of, do I believe that everything is from Hashem or do I not? The more you believe it, the better your life becomes. The less you believe it, the more difficult your life becomes. Rabbi Nachman says in Sichot Aran that the heaviest weight in the world is kafirut, is atheism. And when he says atheism, he doesn't mean, I don't believe in God. The atheism that Rabbi Nachman is speaking about is I don't believe everything is from Hashem. That's kafir, according to Rabbi Nachman, that this is the heaviest weight in the world. This strangles us. This suffocates us. And this is what we need to work to remove from ourselves. This is the thing which is causing our suffering. We need to move away from kafir and we need to move towards amuna. The reason why Rabbi Nachman says my fire is going to burn until Mashiach comes is because what's going to cause the coming of the Mashiach of the Geula is not low-grade, chalavstam, regular type of kashrut when it comes to Amuna. In the end, the Jewish soul at the end of time, he needs the Amuna of fire. He needs the Amuna of cool waters. He needs the Amuna of the wellsprings that comes from before existence. He needs to move towards Amuna Shlema, complete Amuna. That everything is from Hashem. He needs to move towards the Amun of Chalav Yisrael, the milk that comes only from the greatest source. 
He needs to move toward Beit Yosef meat, Badat's vegetables. He needs to move towards the most organic, the most kosher type of faith. And it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a, a breeze or a walk in the park to get there. But he needs to have his mind set on this fire type of amuna, the amuna that's shalema. And the only way to do that is to connect to the one who's teaching you. And that takes time, that takes effort, it takes persistence, it takes resilience, it takes getting up again and falling, getting up again and never giving up. But this is the path. Thank you, Daniel. Any you. other questions? Uh, Rabbeinu, we always says that, we always say that, that night represents Galut and Teva and and they represent Da'ad and Geula. Exactly. You got it. And also, what I heard before, what, what I heard before <laughs> is that, what I heard before that, like, we could be, Rob Davey, you still there? Yeah, I'm listening. I'm waiting for the punchline. Let's go. So what I'm trying to say is that, like we could, that once we learn Torah, we could be the greatest Amidei Chachamim, but if we don't learn Torah, we could be like, like you say, monkeys to compare it to Tamidei Chachamim, because I heard this from Rav Yoshi Mizrahi that, that one day that we could be the greatest warriors in the world, we are so monkeys to co compare to Tamid Chacham. We don't want to be monkeys anymore. Yes. We're done with the ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We want to be human beings. You got it. Yes. We, Beautiful. In order to be human beings, we're supposed to be learning Torah. That's right. Very good, David. You got I, it. I heard this yesterday by the Chazak Shior from the Rosh Hashiva of the Mirror that he said something very deep. He, he, asked, he asked us for what we were brought down into, into this world. So, so we, so he told us that that we supposed to be learning Torah because Torah is a uh, is more than a mitzvah. Beautiful, very good, David. Any other questions before we sign off? Emuna. <laughs> very good, David. Any last questions? I want to say that um. Your, your answer to me yesterday was, was great, but this sheer, it was the full answer to what I asked yesterday, 100%. Thank God. Happy. Very good. Very good. Hashem is good to us. You know, uh, even, even though we're going through a lot, all of us personally, collectively, um, he's given us a family of soul searchers. And, um, you know, the greatest suffering is to, is to suffer alone. But uh, Hashem has given us a great Rebbe, and he's given us great friends. And uh, Rebbe Nachman says, you don't have any real friends besides the ones who are uh, on the path of searching for Hashem with you. And uh, thank God, you know, he put us all together now, and we're able to spend time together learning and um, connecting and trying to find uh, deeper truth. And uh, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. They're not going to have this uh, in Olm Haba. So uh, we should really, really appreciate how fortunate that we are and um, how good Hashem is to us, that even despite whatever we're going through, he's allowing us to try and figure this out together. And that's really the key. That's the greatest light itself. Bezrat Hashem, tonight, we're going to have our final lesson of the week. Bezrat Hashem should be a powerful one. It's going to be at 9 p.m. tonight. If you're not local, so you should watch on Zoom. If you are local, you should come to the class. You know, I see that the more that we have Zoom classes, the less people come physically. You're making a big, big mistake for anybody who's listening. Rabbi Nachman says in many different places, the greatest healing in the world can only take place when you hear the Torah come out of the mouth of the teacher. So I give everybody here a very big encouragement that if you live close at all, you should do whatever you can to make it. I used to drive to Brooklyn uh, from New Jersey I used to drive to Brooklyn from Queens for an hour and a half just so I can listen to a half an hour, an hour of something that I thought was true. 
Uh, you don't even realize how powerful the experience is that Rabbi Nachman says, not just of listening to the Torah, but traveling to go listen. That traveling itself to go hear that Torah is a tikkun, it's a rectification for fallen amunah. Okay? So I give everybody a bracha that if you're close enough to come, do what you can to get there. And if not, uh, you know, watch online, do what you can. Yes, uh, Shlomo, go ahead. Yeah, so real quick, I just want to say, if I was able to fly to New York every single day and come visit, I would. Believe me, I would. I'm going to try and come uh, for maybe a week before hopefully going to Israel. I'm going to come if you're still there. So anyway, I also want to say that the class was so, so, I mean, the goosebumps were so intense. Everything you said, every lesson, every, it was, it was, it left an immense impact on, on, on me, uh, really. And I'm beyond grateful. Um, you know, I, I want to say thank you to Daniel that asked the question because when you responded, it brought tears to my eyes, really, really. And uh, and it, it, there's somebody that I know here, a very good friend of mine, who's going through something similar, and I, I can't wait to share this and 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 go through this process with him because we're we're like you said, we're both also the journey to get closer to the Something I got from, I think it was your class from Shreya to Sadiq, right? Uh, uh, with, with Dalia. Thank you ahead of time. Thank you ahead of time for the good, the bad, for everything. You know, it's crazy beautiful. to say. Beautiful, yes. That. It's and very beautiful. It, it, it brought me right back to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. For what? I don't know. For the bad that's to come, I'm not sure why. <laughs> But I'm grateful. I'm absolutely grateful for you for the class and uh, everybody here. So. Beautiful, Shlomo. Very, very beautiful. You should be blessed. You should have an amazing, amazing, happy, happy day. And uh, give the light over to others. Um, you know, thank God. We're very, very fortunate that we have such a great Rebbe. And uh, that we have true advice. And we have true uh, lessons. And we have hope. We have hope in a, in a world that doesn't have, in a generation that lacks uh, any type. That we ourselves are struggling so much. But thank God. Uh, Hashem put us together. Uh, the Rebbe's pulling a lot of strings for us, and we're connecting from all over the world. That we have people in California and Florida and New York and Israel. It's, this is unbelievable. You know, Bezat Hashem, we should be able to hopefully uh, grow more and more. And Rabbi Nachman says, every time that you take a step, you bring another person across the world with you. You don't even know what's happening. So we should all just keep going. And uh, and Bezat Hashem, we should see every state, every country around the world learning the teachings of Rabbi Nachman and Vega, and you will know Mama Shitz is a good ruler. Bezat Hashem, we should see it in our days. Amen. Amen. Now you need to drop the mic. Now you need to drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, yeah, you want to say something? Can I just add something? I just, for everyone that's here. I do it, Nachman. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very good die for everyone to know. Hashem is you're already Hashem's best friend. He's just waiting for you to be his best friend. I Thank think it's you. very good night to know. Yes, very good. I agree with you. Thank you so much, Benny. David, um, you want to um, end us with something sweet? Um, Rabbeinu. <laughs> uh, Rabbeinu, um, are you going to come on Monday for, for the one year yard site of Rav Walking? Bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem. 9.30. Bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem. Okay. Have an amazing, amazing day, everybody.